Well, good morning, everyone, or I guess afternoon in the case of uh, for folks in the east. But uh, regardless, uh, this is Jared Geyer from the Storm Prediction Center in Norman. And uh, we're here today to present to you, share some information, what we're calling our, our winter warm-up. We thought it was a little bit, a little bit early to a bit of a stretch to call it spring training per se, but a bit of a winter warm-up, just kind of touch on some, some changes uh, that we've seen from the Storm Prediction Center uh, perspective over the last uh, several months or so, and uh, share some of those updates with you today. Uh, before we begin, just a, uh, an, one additional reminder to, to, if you haven't already done so, to please mute, mute your phones uh, on that end outside of any uh, questions or interaction. Uh, along those lines, um, I will, uh, I'm happy to, to take your questions, uh, interact, discuss things, especially at the end, but if there's something uh, su uh, substantive, by all means, uh, while we're on something, please feel free to, to uh, uh, interrupt, uh, catch my attention over the, uh, over the uh, conference call here, or um, I'll try and uh, periodically pause and take a peek at, uh, into the GoToWebinar software to see if there are any questions, what have you, in there. Uh, I believe we're maybe have a few additional people sign on. Uh, I think we're expecting around 20 or so. Uh, WFOs out there uh, to sign on. I believe, uh, I think there also may be some emergency management folks also uh, sitting in from what it so sounds like. And um, so um, with that, we'll go ahead and get started. In, uh, in terms of what we'll be talking about today, we want to uh, do a recap of the outlook changes that have happened since, uh, since principally since October of last year. And um, we really haven't had, uh, even for a cool season, obviously things are typically quieter, but even for an average cool season, it seems like uh, uh, it have been a, a very quiet. And, and some of these changes really haven't, in many senses, haven't seen the, uh, too much uh, in the light of day in terms of actual um, uh, appearing in our outlooks and, and so forth. So I wanted to kind of do a recap of those. Uh, uh, obviously, we'll be ramping up pretty quickly here as we go into uh, the springtime. And so a recap of those uh, convective outlook changes. We'll also talk about a, uh, just take the opportunity to touch on some aspects of watch philosophy and uh, outlook collaboration. And then towards the end, we'll provide a number of updates on a host of, of website tools that are now available on the SPC website. Well, for those folks who haven't had a chance to, to visit us in here in Norman, we are in the National Weather Center. Uh, the National Weather Center was built uh, principally in 06 or opened up in 06. And uh, so the National Weather Center, we're, we're on the second floor of that building. We're on the, uh, a part of the OU campus. And uh, so this is a peek inside our operations area, what it might look like on a given day. You can see the outlook, or rather the forecaster positions uh, labeled. Uh, we typically have uh, four to five forecasters on at a given time. And uh, that includes not only folks, uh, while most of them are devoted to convective uh, severe weather uh, sorts of forecasting, we also do have um, fire weather uh, forecasters on during the daytime and overnight as well. And um, a, a little bit of comparison contrast from, from WFOs. We are uh, a little more uh, staff for, for all sorts of severe weather, everything from the quiet, the routine types of days, but also the higher end days. Uh, and so we don't utilize over time extra staffing nearly as much as the WFO might in severe weather ops. However, on, on bigger sorts of days, especially when there's uh, prevalent severe weather in, in the warm sector of a system, but Perhaps also there's widespread uh, winter weather ongoing. We may utilize additional people for that, or sometimes in rare cases, additional uh, perhaps an additional lead forecaster in issuing watches. Those uh, those types of uh, things. But but for the most part, we're, we're staffed 24/7 for the for uh, to be able to handle the vast majority of, of scenarios and situations. Okay, some of the background in terms of the outlook changes uh, that have taken place. Uh, we note here that risk communication is fundamentally linked to science-based threat probabilities. It's very much a, a part of what we do, and that drives the communication intensi uh, intensity and the related decision support. So those probabilities, again, are, are central to, to all SPC convective outlooks. 
And in fact, the underlying severe weather probabilities dictate uh, what you see in the convective outlook, uh, the categorical uh, graphics. And the SPC has a, a relatively long history now, 15 plus years of issuing those probabilistic forecasts. We've been doing those since 1999. And for the day one period, in terms of the day one convective outlooks, that includes uh, three sets of probabilities for tornadoes, hail, and damaging winds. Now into the day two and day time frame, uh, day two and three time frame, uh, we do those in terms of all uh, hazards combined. Perhaps a, years, a few years down the road, we may venture into to more details, perhaps on the day two, for example. But as of right now, day two and day three are, are, are all severe weather hazards combined. Well, in terms of those probabilistic numbers, uh, we always like to, to uh, remind folks that those inherently, uh, by definition, are the probability or the chance of having a severe weather event within a 25-mile radius. So when you see those numbers, uh, for example, we'll take a 5% tornado sort of situation. Basically, you have a 1 in 20 shot of at your point and then tw a 25-mile radius around you uh, of seeing a tornado uh, in, those, uh, in those sorts of situations on that given day. And so those, uh, that's, that's uh, I think, crucial insight in terms of you know, the core definition uh, of what those probabilities are uh, in, in terms of uh, yeah, and keeping that in mind in, in terms of when you see the, the forecast probabilities uh, uh, in our outlooks. Another way to, to kind of look at things, uh, to kind of give you a baseline um, familiarization in terms of the actual probability numbers themselves, uh, we certainly know that uh, uh, to kind of do an analogy here, we certainly know that uh, uh, there's an official definition, for instance, of probabilities of precipitation pops. But we know if you ask individual meteorologists, or, or we all struggle uh, in ways to kind of uh, characterize it and describe it to the public, what have you. Well, certainly that's uh, arguably even more of a challenge in terms of severe probabilities. It's that challenge of trying to really com uh, communicate and scientifically quantify things that are just inherently very rare, especially when you're talking about a, a very particular uh, location. It's, it's always inherently, a, even on the biggest days, there's a relatively uh, a very small probability that, that your individual uh, dwelling or your location, what have you, is, is going to be uh, directly impacted. Uh, and so, and so here's a map that, that shows the tornado probabilities on a given day. This is from late April. We're kind of getting near the peak here in the southern plains of, of tornado potential. And so this snapshot, this based on long-term climatology, 82 to 2011. And this shows uh, the, the daily climatology, the, what you would expect, uh, typically, um, what, what you're on, on any given day, uh, regardless of the exact meteorological scenario, uh, the underlying probability of, of experiencing a tornado within that 25 miles of a point. And as we note here in the upper left, uh, recall that, that SPC uh, forecast tornado probabilities begin at 2%. So how that's key is basically, uh, in this instance, as you get into the springtime, if we're forecasting just a 2% um, sort of scenario in Southern Plains, say in Oklahoma, well, really, truth be told, we're really not that far uh, in terms of magnitude above uh, the actual underlying probabilities. Now, certainly there are other ramifications if you're earlier, later in the year, or other parts of the country that aren't quite as severe weather prone. Then in those cases, you may have uh, probabilities that are actually five, ten, uh, multiple dozens, or even more uh, times the underlying uh, uh, climatological risk. But uh, just keep that in mind in terms of, of the probabilities and, and how those numbers come into play in terms of our forecast. Another way to look at the regional differences in severe weather risk is admittedly a bit of a, uh, a uh, busy uh, sort of sort of image here, but we'll, we'll spend a minute on it. And uh, just to kind of familiarize yourself with it, on the left-hand side, or the y-axis, we have the daily probability of one or more tornadoes. And those are, that's labeled on the left. Now, on the lower part of the diagram, basically run, we run from the beginning of the year to the end of the year. We also have a key here in the upper right. And we're, we're noting four different locations. That includes Oklahoma City in the red uh, information plot line, 
uh, is Oklahoma City, the Denver area in green, Jackson, Mississippi in the blue, and then the Washington, D.C. area here in the purple magenta uh, sort of collar. And what these scattered tornado plots show are basically the individual daily probabilities based on the actual currents from 1980 to 2012. It's that daily probability of one or more tornadoes. I think much more practical is a smooth uh, uh, approach where you're kind of averaging the days. And from those smooth curbs, uh, curves, you can see here for Oklahoma City, uh, as we mentioned earlier, we tend to peak out from the April to uh, May time frame in terms of tornado probabilities. The Denver area is a bit later, of course, and in, in more into June, uh, and even actually a higher magnitude in terms of uh, from the perspective of all tornadoes. The Jackson, Mississippi area, well, the amplitude's not quite as high, although we do see two distinct, two distinct peaks, uh, not only in the spring uh, peak, but also a, a peak uh, in, the, in November into December time frame, so that kind of second severe weather season. Now, the D.C. area is a little bit more into the summer, but also not, not nearly the amplitude of, of, say, Oklahoma City or Denver, even Jackson, for that matter. And uh, so uh, I think the bottom line sense of this is, is even these higher, uh, relatively higher climatological risk areas, we still peak out at about 1.5 or just under 2%. So again, our tornado probabilities, they start at 2%, go upwards of 5%, 10%. So even in the case of, say, for instance, the, the Denver area where uh, maybe in June we have a 5% uh, uh, risk or let's say a 10% risk, well, that's still, uh, if we have a 10% tornado risk forecast, that's still going to be uh, a rough way to think about it is still five plus times uh, the, the daily comatology uh, in terms of severe risk. So those are the kind of things that, that we need to keep in mind when looking, uh, at least in underlying sense, in terms of the forecast probabilities and, and how they're derived. As far as the actual uh, changes in terms of the day one through three convective outlooks, uh, those were revised uh, with, the, uh, with the purpose to, to hopefully better communicate risk and describe the likelihood of severe weather. I uh, should note there it's informed by social science and, and numerous uh, customer feedback. And this includes the addition of two new categories for the SPC convective outlook. In essence, going from three outlook categories to now five outlook categories. And those changes to the day one through three convective outlooks became effective on October 22nd of, of this last year. Some rationale, uh, thoughts on the rationale behind the changes. It's, it's several years of customer feedback on the limitations of that, that pesky uh, C text term uh, that's <laughs> been around for, for a long time. And then also even slight terminology. Uh, a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, folks feel that, that slight, especially in terms of uh, given its commonality, uh, maybe is, is not the ideal word uh, in terms of conveying days where there's uh, regional sorts of uh, severe weather threats uh, that, that maybe that's underdoing it a bit uh, and those type of things. On the plus side, slide has a long history. It's been around a long time and, and there's a long history with it and, and uh, there's obviously limitations in, in any words that we could choose. And, uh, but we need to keep in mind that, that there is a long uh, term history and context uh, to these terms as well. So as I mentioned, slight, moderate, and high terminology, they've been used in essence for around 40 years. They do have an established understanding, and these thresholds do essentially remain unchanged in terms of these uh, newer uh, ways of going about the convective outlooks. Uh, many days and areas commonly dwell in slight risk. It's, it's obviously the most common sort of, of risk beyond just the, the, the most marginal uh, days, but certainly it's, it's uh, of the, the more appreciable sorts of risk, it's, it's very common as you get into the springtime uh, and uh, into the summer. But there is much more detailed forecast information that we've been doing for the last 15 plus years that's contained within, within the SPC probabilistic outlooks. So the new categorical, categorical outlooks will now more directly convey this information in the forefront. In terms of the forefront, I think there's, there seems to be a little doubt um, and we can look at, at how the information is, is shared, social media, web hits, what have you, or 
I know us how we even internally talk about the outlooks in terms of, uh, of shift briefings, what have you. By and large, it seems like people, and rightly so, go to the categorical outlook. It's kind of that one-stop shop in terms of the severe weather threat. And uh, it doesn't seem like nearly as many people consult the underlying prob uh, probabilities, uh, what have you. Well, now that'll, it'll, uh, at least in subtle ways, uh, or uh, a little more directly convey that information uh, into, uh, in the forefront in terms of the categorical outlooks. Well, somewhere it may, may beg the question, do we have the resolution, the ability to, to slice the baloney that thin, so to speak? Do we have the ability uh, to forecast at, at the resolution uh, that, that's offered up by our probabilities? Because now the probabilities, the resolution, if you will, that we forecast on them are now uh, quite a bit more lockstep with what we're actually doing on the categorical. Well, I have a slide here that addresses some long-term uh, some long-term probability verification is actually information verification uh, of SPC forecasts from 2007 to 2013. This encompasses nearly 13,000 outlooks. So it's a day one convective outlook. Uh, we'll call it a reliability uh, uh, crew look at, uh, at some verification numbers here. And so on the right-hand side, you'll see hail, wind, and tornado information. The left part of that table is what our actual forecast thresholds are. So you can see that 5%, 15, 30, and so on for hail and wind. Obviously, you get those upper end numbers, for example, 60% hail, 60% wind, and even like 45 tornado. Those, those are going to be uh, relatively rare and just a, a small subset. But by and large, if you look at the, you compare the, the forecast threshold on the left-hand side of the table to actually what was observed within an 80-kilometer grid box, you can see roughly there's uh, an upward step in terms of the probabilities that corresponds uh, to what we forecast in terms of uh, in terms of the severe weather probabilities, probabilities, whether it be hail, wind, or uh, tornado. So the the addition of of slight was, was included to address concern or excuse me, the, the addition of enhanced was, a, was added to address a concern about slight and uh, the associated word meaning in the probabilistic range. And also, uh, to help things, we've added numbers and also tried to pay careful attention, consult with uh, others, including social science, about the callers and, and conveying their relative, um, their relative uh, um, uh, distribution or layout of the, of the category. So it's that notion of hopefully the numbers, colors help, uh, even if the, the term is foreign to someone who, who may not be a, uh, a higher end user, that type of thing, hopefully they can see the relationship and, and know, uh, be able to at least somewhat ascertain what's a lower end threat versus a higher end, end threat and so forth. And uh, again, as mentioned, the social science community is heavily engaged in the planning process and a lot of these details. So the way it shakes out in a little more detail for the day one, two, and three categorical outlook uh, changes. So the categories uh, were increased to five levels for day one and two. There is a caveat there for day three, since a high risk is not forecast, uh, we don't we don't do those uh, that far out on day three. It's it was increased to four levels for it. But uh, that that C text term goes away, and that's uh, converted to a marginal risk. And so a line and area is uh, newly added to the categorical outlook, whereas before you would just kind of see an, a spatially ambiguous C text label uh, on the map. Now we're actually bringing to the forefront front, uh, an aerial uh, representation, a graphical representation of, of those lower probabilities on the categorical outlook. The slide gets uh, divided into two, in essence, so the, the lower the regular sorts of slides, uh, we'll call them, those remain the same, but the upper end is actually split out into that enhanced category, or another way to think about it is an enhanced slide, if you will. And so it's that upper end uh, that, that becomes a new category, and a lot of times, I know internally here, we refer to it as, uh, as a higher end slide uh, type term. Obviously, that, that might be a little more confusing with, with uh, uh, you know, having a high risk, what have you, but, but uh, for last number of years, we'll, we'll refer to the difference between uh, 
well, some might say a garden variety slight risk and, and uh, a slight risk with a little more meat to it. And so that's the, the insight behind the, the enhanced or enhanced slide, if you will. Now the moderate, that's essentially unchanged. There is a, technically a, a requirement that, that SIG be forecast. Now by and large, on, on most cases that were prior moderate risk, the vast majority of them have a corresponding SIG uh, with them. It's the notion that, that if we're forecasting a moderate risk, by and large, we already uh, would tend to use a, the, there was oftentimes a, a threat for significant severe weather as well. So we'll call that essentially unchanged as far as the moderate risk go. And then the high risk uh, basically remain the same as well. Another way to look at the, the details of the outlook changes for days one, two, and three. So this uh, table on the lower, uh, middle lower part of the, the, the slide shows the outlook probability to categorical descriptions. And so in essence, what we're doing here, as I mentioned, we take the probabilities, actually the peak probabilities, or we take the, the peak category, and that becomes the dominant on the, uh, on the new categorical outlooks, so or similar to, to actually the way we were doing things prior to the change. So I'll give you a quick example. Uh, the top part here is day one, day two, and then day three is on the bottom. But for example, if we were forecasting a 2% tornado risk day, but then we were forecasting a 15% wind and hail, uh, we come up with marginal on tornado, but, but hail and wind are slight. Slight would be the dominant category. That would, that would be what you would see on the categorical outlook in terms of uh, it would be the hail and the wind that's, that's driving that, that slight risk. So in terms of the core changes, again, we increase the risk categories to five levels for days one and two, and four levels for, the, for day three. So replacing CTEX with marginal for those lowest risk probabilities. And then enhanced is inserted between the higher end slight and the lower end uh, moderate uh, probabilities. We'll take a quick look at some retrospective case examples and just to, to illustrate the, some of these changes, especially given that we haven't had all that many severe weather uh, events to actually uh, illustrate some of these changes in, in practical terms uh, since, uh, since the latter part of the year. Here's a case from, from 2013 Hattiesburg, Mississippi tornado event. Uh, on the upper left is the, the prior uh, way of doing things, so to speak, where you have a, a relatively broad, uh, slight risk in terms of the categorical outlook on the upper left. Now, in the upper right, if you look at the underlying probabilities, this is the day one uh, tornado outlook. And you, you can note there that in the yellow, uh, there's a yellow 10% area that shows up across parts of, center across parts of Louisiana, Mississippi. And there's also a significant uh, area drawn in as well as a subset. So that 10 sig area, uh, or actually the, the whole 10 area, that would actually be an enhanced in the, in the new system. And you can see in the lower left uh, the actual uh, events that occurred that day, which, which would have correspond fairly well with uh, the enhanced area. So uh, that's a case where, where maybe using the enhanced would have, would have brought that underlying probabilistic information a little more to the forefront. Some other examples, we'll, we'll start on the lower end and work our way up. On the upper left part of each of these, uh, of this slide and, and a couple of the subsequent ones, you'll see the, the old uh, way of doing things on the upper left and the new on the lower right. And uh, so the old, you can see a, a C text in the, over the Pacific Northwest and then also a C text uh, over the Central Plains. Again, we'll note there the, the relative ambiguity without looking at the probabilities, you don't know the, well, without con consulting the probabilities or even reading the text, you don't really have a, a, a great gauge in terms of how, how spatially broad uh, the the severe weather threat that, that's driving that is, uh, uh, whereas in the lower right, you, you can see, a, uh, note the two marginal areas that are drawn in over the Pacific Northwest, and then also parts of uh, Kansas, Oklahoma, uh, regarding the other sea tech. So that's the way the changes look on the lower end. Now let's go up a bit, and not only do we have the marginal area in the uh, uh, dark green in this case, but we go from having enhanced areas, a subset, uh, that, that's uh, drawn in as well. So we go from the, the relatively more coarse, slight risk, into a little more detail here on the lower right. Now on the very upper end of things, this is Super Outbreak 2, April 27, 2011. The upper left example has a slight, moderate, 
and high risk, the, the uh, legacy traditional uh, categories. But this, uh, again, adds in the, the marginal uh, risk, the lower probabilities uh, in, in, in addition to the enhanced category that's inserted between the sl uh, slight risk and the moderate risk as well. Also take a chance here to note here in the lower right, uh, again, the, the, the notion of uh, not only the colors, but the addition of numbers uh, as well for those folks that are, that are more inclined to, to 0 to 5 or 1 to 5. Uh, sorts of uh, um, uh, numerical uh, ways of, of looking at the categories. So there's two new convective outlook categories. The marginal enhanced were added uh, last October and subjectively calibrate scientifically skillful probabilistic forecasts do drive all SP forecast, SPC forecast and related risk communication. So those outlook changes will result in categorical outlooks containing more of the detail that was already available in the underlying SPC probabilistic forecast. In terms of some of the ways of conveying that information, uh, here's a couple examples. We're, we're still very much working on this. This is uh, we will have state outlook graphics coming soon to the SPC website, and these are examples from April 27, 2011, and uh, basically these will be statewide. Uh, closer in uh, examinations of the categorical outlooks. Uh, we certainly real, realize and heard feedback over the years that, that our, um, our nationwide uh, uh, outlook graphics, they, they do a, uh, in terms of graphically information, uh, they arguably do a decent job on a nationwide scale, but if you try to uh, zoom into them, that t uh, type of thing, are, are not <laughs> necessarily terribly is, uh, or aesthetically pleasing. And so we're trying to do a way to uh, find a way to, to more, uh, in a more uh, presentation-friendly way, serve that information up in a, in a more automatic sense uh, to have it uh, available to uh, end users, what have you. So here's a couple examples of, of what that would look like uh, in, in some of the things we're working on. This will all be part of a, a broader awareness uh, overview type page that, that we're planning to add to the SPC website. And for the WFO folks, we're also planning to make available, uh, for your purposes, uh, inf this information available on a CWA uh, type basis. Uh, we're not planning to have it publicly available on the SVC website. It'll kind of be a permanent link behind the scenes, but it'll be there if 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 you guys would find it helpful in any way uh, in terms of uh, things like social media, uh, uh, graphic cast web. Web, web updates and, and what have you, and we're certainly open uh, to, to ways to customize these in terms of cities, that, that sort of thing. Uh, kind of the brains uh, here behind that is Patrick Marsh who's been working on, on these uh, uh, types of images. So certainly if you have any uh, insight requests, you can certainly uh, um, provide those to me or contact Patrick directly. But uh, just to, to give you an idea of some of the things we're working on, that may be available as soon as the next month or so, but certainly I think by the time we get uh, uh, in more into the uh, springtime, we're planning to have these uh, state and even CWA uh, sorts of outlook graphics uh, become available on our website. Okay, in terms of, we'll talk about some of the changes in terms of the day four through eight uh, convective outlooks. And we note here that the uh, new forecast threshold of 15%, that was added. Uh, for the days four through eight, and that was added in mid-December of this past year. And so the rationale, the insight behind that is prior to the change, only areas of probabilities of 30% were drawn. So we didn't necessarily, we didn't used to label it as 30%, although in the accompanying description, say on our website and so forth, um, and internally how we went about it was we were using a 30% probability as kind of the standard. Uh, 30%, another way to look at that, just kind of in plain terms, is that 30% roughly, you can think of that corresponding to a higher end slight risk or moderate risk and above as you uh, roll around to the day one time frame. So it's a fairly uh, a severe weather threat of, of, uh, of relative significance was, was the criteria. So hence there are a lot of days, actually the vast majority of outlooks, uh, especially outside of the spring, uh, didn't contain that many areas in terms of the uh, uh, in, in terms of the outlooks. We were more looking for regional, very organized, or even regional outbreak sorts of scenarios. 
So we think the addition of a, of a lower probability threshold, that will help us uh, communicate severe weather threats earlier in the forecast process. Uh, when forecasts are confidence or forecast severe potential is lower than a 30% uh, probability threshold. Certainly received a lot of feedback in terms about, well, from WFOs about we're talking about a severe weather threat and HWO, what have you, and you know consistency issues. And, and so having another tool in the toolbox, so to speak, where, where another uh, uh, ability to, to add another line uh, I think will be helpful in that regard because previously, even though it was a probabilistic threshold, things were still rather binary. Like I say, most days did not have would not contain a line in the day four through eight outlook. So it was largely days where uh, nothing would would be reflected in terms of the graphical um, outlook for days four through eight. We might be discussing a scenario in the text, but not really anything uh, corresponding graphics to, to go along with that. So the addition of a new 15% forecast threshold, that will uh, also contribute to a greater consistency in the forecast transition as we go from days four to eight for a given scenario into the day three time frame. So previously, for days four through eight, as I mentioned, only a single line area was draw for, drawn for any day. Well, then the next day would roll around as, as it transitions into the day three time frame, and we'd have to go much more detailed with incremental severe probabilities ranging from, well, starting as low as 5% and above, uh, upwards to, uh, to 45, what have you. So it, it was going from, a, in essence, a 30% down to a 5 type threshold. This will, I think, offer a little more natural transition for uh, forecasters and recipients on the other end, what have you. And uh, so that's some additional uh, insight in, in to, into the day 4 through 8 changes. We'll take a look at a graphical example here. And previously, only a single line with a 30% threshold was, was shown. So uh, under the previous way of doing things, if we were looking at this graphic, in essence, uh, we would only see one line. It would be this, this line of, of, of a 30% caliber uh, that would show up across Oklahoma, Kansas, and Missouri. But the second line uh, is added, as you see here in the yellow, that encompasses a broader part of the Central Plains and Midwest. And so uh, we get a little more... Uh, ability, a little more resolution showing up in these uh, day four through eight convective outlooks with the addition of that 15% line. Now I'll let this loop through here a couple times, this example of what things might look like uh, as you go into the springtime on a, on a general scenario. So on day four, we'll see our, our graphic that was previously up. We'll have our 30% and then you can see the surrounding 15%. Again, this whole sequence uh, under the previous, prior to, to mid-December of last year in this theoretical scenario, only the, the one line, that 30% that type line on day four would have shown up. Otherwise, the graphics would have uh, been relatively uh, blank, so to speak. So in terms of typical of the way things might shake out on a, a given springtime scenario, see the, the 15, 30% area on day four, uh, it generally shifts east northeast, 15% area on day five, and then a, a, a corresponding shift on day six, and then by seven, day seven and day eight, uh, the potential or predictability uh, become too low. So, in summary, in, in regards to the day four through eight convective outlooks, uh, again, those were were changed in mid-December of this past year. But uh, I will note uh, we've only had, I believe, one one uh, shot of, of adding the additional, uh, the, the additional uh, of actually utilizing uh, the 15% uh, delineating one uh, so far. So uh, things have been relatively quiet, and um, so we've only had real one shot of, of actually forecasting a 15% area in day four on a given day. And uh, so again, that, that changed in mid-December, but we've not had a lot of uh, practical usage of it so far. Prior to the change, only areas of uh, probabilities of 30% were forecast. And as I mentioned earlier, you can think of those roughly in August, uh, expectations of higher and slight moderate risk or, or above that. This change will allow SPC forecasters to, to highlight a lower threshold of severe weather potential between days four through eight while still drawing attention to areas with a more consequential severe risk. So I think it's important to know that, that the 30% area remains uh, basically consistent, so it's analogous to that, that mid-December uh, change. So we're still preserving the 30% but adding a lower threshold as well. 
Well, we also wanted to talk or kind of recap some things in terms of watch philosophy. I think a lot of will just be review for us, and, and but we also want to keep in mind that there's always an influx of, of new forecasters, new interns coming in into the National Weather Service. So we wanted to touch upon uh, some aspects of, of watch philosophy. So our, our, our goal is to issue severe weather watches at least 30, 60 minutes prior to the onset of organized, sustained severe weather. Doesn't always happen, but, but that's what uh, uh, we try to do, all things equal. Uh, and uh, watch duration is typically four to seven hours. That that can vary some, but but the, the line share of them fall out in that four to six, or excuse me, four to seven uh, hour time frame. Uh, watch size can vary greatly, but will, usually can range somewhere in the neighborhood of 8,045,000 uh, square miles. Uh, also, have a note here about watch lead time. Uh, our watch lead time, um, we're, we're tasked with all things equal of, of increased lead time whenever possible. Uh, you can think about it, it's probably analogous to, to WFO folks being tasked with uh, similar standards in terms of war, uh, convective warnings, severe thunderstorm warnings, tornado warnings, or even winter weather for that matter, uh, where it's the push to, to provide longer lead time as, as guidance, our abilities, and so forth improve. Uh, but there is the other side of the coin is uh, that longer lead time can lead to, to larger uncertainty. So we have those same uh, influences in, in terms of trying to get uh, watch lead time increase, but we also need to respect the false alarm as well. And so that, that delicate uh, balance between the two. In terms of severe weather, or excuse me, severe thunderstorm watches uh, themselves, as far as severe thunderstorm uh, watches go, it's a, the notion of, of going after organized uh, thunderstorms. Um, typically, when we say organized, we're kind of um, all things equal, starting out with a, a mindset of, of some vertical shear, uh, you know, some baseline threshold uh, for more um, organized, um, uh, uh, significant, uh, sustained severe weather. And as noted there, organized thunderstorms include, of course, things like supercell, squall lines, MCSs, things that we really especially want to want to capture uh, within watches when, whenever we can are the more significant severe weather episodes. So especially hail two inches in, in diameter or greater in those uh, measured thunderstorm gusts, 65 knots or greater, especially that we might see associated with more organized squall lines, MCSs. So aside from the, the organized, and, and there's also sustained multi-hour type criteria, excuse me, the, the official uh, criteria also includes, uh, as noted there, the expectation for a minimum of six hail or, hail or wind events during a valid time in areas of the watch. And so that, uh, truth be told, that number is actually the same since when I arrived at the SPC in, in 2003, arguably, uh, there's some notion that may be a bit low nowadays, that, that sort of thing. But uh, that's that's at least the official uh, uh, definition, and uh, um, as it, as it stands now, in terms of the minimum uh, expectations, uh, baseline expectations for for reports uh, that we should see during the the valid time and area of a watch. As far as tornado watches go, uh, those are issued when the potential exists for multiple tornadoes. Those can be of any magnitude. Uh, we also uh, are asked to issue tornado watches when the possibility exists for one or more significant tornadoes. I think we especially, uh, kind of the classic scenario of this is, is during the uh, cool season, especially the Gulf Coast, southeast part of, part of the United States, uh, when you have low cape, high shear sorts of regimes. It's that notion of uh, perhaps the, the magnitude, the, the the magnitude, the number of reports is a bit in question in terms of exactly how widespread the severe weather uh, may be in some cases, but yet if where severe weather does occur, uh, the possibility of tornadoes and, and given the oftentimes the degree of vertical shear that's in place, there could be a significant tornado even in a relatively uh, limited uh, buoyancy sort of regime. So that's kind of the classic scenario for that secondary bullet of, of when one or more uh, significant tornadoes uh, could occur. That's also uh, may prompt a tornado watch issuance. This elite forecaster in this case is Steve Corfiti on a watch coordination call with uh, WFOs, and in front of him he has a has a, a kind of the draft initial proposed watch uh, up. He has the ability on the adjacent screens to toggle counties on and off, zoom in, what have you, 
and uh, so he's conducting this uh, this call and, and discussing the, the corresponding threat, watch type, counties included, and so forth. So the watch by county process, of course, that enhances collaboration between WFOs and the SPC. And uh, of course, it's uh, come around to the consensus on the need for a watch and watch type. And obviously, the counties are agreed upon before watch issuance. Some notes here on the watch extensions. Um, we already do, a, I think, a great job of this uh, by and large. But, but just a few reminders here. Uh, it's important for those to be coordinated between the SPC and WFOs. We ideally want to shoot for at least 20 to 30 minutes prior to the scheduled watch expiration. Extensions in time can technically be done up to two hours. Uh, obviously, other WFOs as part of the process do need to be notified uh, um, in a bottom line sense by WFOs. But certainly on the SPC end of things, we're happy to uh, help facilitate that uh, as well. And another point there is, is that's not only just neighboring WFOs, it's, uh, it's, it's all WFOs that, that are impacted uh, by the watch need to be notified uh, if, if uh, extension in time is being considered, such that they can clear or uh, consider uh, extending themselves as well. So that's the extension in time. We also have the ability to extend an area. That's when sustained severe weather is expected to move outside of the original watch may linger in the same CWA for an hour or two, then an extension in area may be prudent. Now, in some cases, a new watch may be needed for longer duration severe weather threats or moving into additional CWAs, uh, that type of thing. So uh, also in a new state, technically, the way the rules are, uh, we're uh, ideally not supposed to go into additional states because of uh, the public um, part of the, the watch product, what have you. Uh, so the, those are the kind of considerations where we may need to talk about whether we do an EXA, EXA extension in area or whether a new watch uh, may be needed for, for an entirely new watch for a longer duration, uh, increased spatial area sort of severe weather threat. <clears throat> Some additional recent uh, changes we wanted to touch on. We've added a plain language summary in the top part of our uh, upper part of our uh, convective outlooks. We try to I'm trying to provide that in terms of a, a more public friendly bottom line type overview uh, of what's going on in the given day. We've also uh, since last year in, in terms of one two planet have our, our former collaboration window uh, for the day two convective outlooks that we started last year. And the day two convective outlook, it's updated at 1730Z. So just for review, the day two convective outlook goes out uh, initially at, uh, by 1 a.m. Uh, local time, uh, central standard of daylight time. And then it's updated late morning, early afternoon. So it's updated uh, once. So there are two total day two convective outlooks. And then that leads into the day one. Uh, outlook process. And so we thought that was a very logical one to, to start on, not only our, our abilities shift logistics here, but we also felt it was a very important outlook uh, to, to really focus on for in terms of more formal collaboration because of the, the notion of, of the day two update really setting the tone for the initial day one. When the day one uh, forecaster comes in the evening, they're using that day two update kind of as a, uh, basically the starting point, the draft for their upcoming day one outlook. And so um, uh, we felt that was a, seemed like a, a, leg, a logical way to, to start out a, a more formal collaboration process. And you'll see there noted in 1-2 Planet, it's a separate chat room. It's SPC underscore day two. We're in there um, all times of the year, not even just, just higher end days. But we're in there at least formally from 1530Z to 1630Z, that two to one hour. Uh, preceding 1730. We have a hard, fast deadline. Uh, in September, the standards are actually tracked where we need to be 99% and above, uh, uh, truth be told, in terms of our, our forecast issuances. So we, it's very important for us to get those out by 1730. So we wanted to build in time preceding the outlook, ability to reflect any changes, uh, what have you. And uh, so it's a separate chat room, which may not be ideal in some circumstances, but the reason why that was done is so that uh, uh, neighboring WFOs who may share s similar concerns, what have you, this will allow for easier facilitation of w other WFOs to, to kind of uh, take part in what's going on if, if, uh, if uh, 
uh, a given WFO has a concern or suggestion in terms of, uh, of outlook uh, adjustments, uh, what have you. And all this said, uh, I do need to emphasize that this, even though this is just a, a kind of a road into, down the road of uh, formal collaboration, that's not to say that, that any time you have concerns, suggestions, comments, concerns, uh, you're certainly welcome to call us on the phone or 1-2-Planet, uh, uh, so we're, we're still very much open to that. But this is just a, a look into a, uh, down the road of a little more formal collaboration. Okay, uh, the rest of the presentation here we'll, we'll briefly touch on, highlight some of the new web tools that we have uh, on the SPC website. Uh, first and foremost, we're kind of throwing a bone here to, to uh, fire weather uh, folks. This is um, in an otherwise probably largely convectively dominated outlook or uh, related presentation. But this dry thunderstorm guidance, you can see the direct URL uh, listed at the top. This is an update to a, a dry thunderstorm guidance page that we've had around for a number of years, maybe last 10 years or so. This is a little more modern update to it with increased functionality. And unfortunately, I don't have a great example to show you given the, the uh, weather pattern. But uh, basically, in the lower left, you have the ability to, to toggle on different uh, dry uh, thunderstorm uh, parameter thresholds. Basically, uh, the short of it is going after scenarios, uh, particularly in the western uh, U.S. where uh, thunderstorms may occur, but there's expected to be little, uh, if any, wetting rainfall. You have other parameters you can toggle on and off here, wind, RH, what have you, or uh, precipitable water, rather. And um, so that's available in the lower left. And you also have geopolitical uh, toggles, state, county, boundaries, CWAs, fire weather zones, and so forth. You can also do regional zoom in sectors. And so we wanted to share that that page is available. Another one that we have is the Experimental Storm Reports page. If you click, uh, you, you'll see it linked from our uh, front page. Or if you click anything on our front page and go to the Legacy left side menu, it's noted as or labeled as Xperia Storm Reports, I believe. And previously, we just kind of had a, a, a daily uh, storm reports map, a legacy one, uh, which is still there, but you didn't really have any functionality uh, abilities beyond the actual day to, to um, change up the graphic uh, in many ways. This will actually provide, this one actually provides the ability to toggle off certain types of reports, uh, tornadoes, hail, wind gusts, and so forth. As you can see here on the upper left, you can scroll to different days. Also, there is a, I don't have an example for you here, but, but you can also plot winter reports. Now the caveat there is it only plot winter reports uh, that are, are associated with LSR. So if, uh, and I know there are some regional offices, office differences uh, in those. So if, if someone is only sending out uh, snowfall reports, uh, let's say in, in terms of public information statements, those will not appear on this website. So uh, just a, a note, caveats in terms of the winter reports. So as I mentioned, you have the ability to toggle on and off different information. We even kind of use it as a, we can use it as a, a subjective sort of ver verification by uh, turning on the overlays of, of our outlooks and getting an idea, idea of whether severe weather occurred in relation to our outlooks. You have other background images you can add on here, county boundaries, CWAs, highways, and even a, a crude population type imagery as well. The remaining images I'm going to show you are all, can all be found from uh, the forecast tools link on the left side of our page. Again, this is the older legacy uh, menu that, that you see once you go into the SPC website. So everything can be found from forecast tools on the left-hand side. These arrows kind of highlight some of the things we're going to subsequently show here on the next few slides. First one up is the sound and climatology page that we have the direct URL at the top, but again, you can also find it from the forecast tools. And this shows, this is a RAOB climatology in essence, a long-term climatology. This example I have here is for the Norman uh, area. Now there is a period of record that appears on the bottom where you can see the, the, the core details of what's going into this. So it includes not only uh, Norman, uh, more modern Norman uh, specific soundings, but also uh, some older uh, aspects, the database Oklahoma City, um, uh, principally, and so it's a long-term uh, RAOB database. In this particular example, uh, it has a precipitable water. You can see the trend from um, as we go deeper in the springtime and, and into the summer. 
And so on a given day, you can kind of get an idea for, for uh, how it relates to typical norms. Graphically here, we have noted the uh, thresholds ra ranging from minimum uh, uh, in terms of a moving average in 10, 25 percentile, 75th, and 90th percentile, and max uh, on the upper end. And it's available for a, a host of uh, RAYOB sites, as you can see on this map toward the upper left. And you can even break it out by 0Z and 12Z uh, uh, time frames. And then we'll expand this lower uh, left menu to kind of give you an idea of the number of parameters that are available. It's, it's lots of mandatory level information. It includes instability parameters K, uh, such as K, LCL, LLCs, LLC rather, um, in various um, uh, measures of CAPE, just a, a host of information, dozens upon dozens of parameters that are available uh, for you to look at in terms of a climatological uh, sense. We'll also touch on uh, some aspects of the mesoanalysis. Just to, uh, some of these are more just reminders from changes uh, that you may have noticed over the last couple years. On our mesoanalysis page, of course, we have uh, fixed sectors nowadays in terms of the mesoanalysis. We do have, on the right-hand side, image overlays and underlays that are available. In the lower right, we actually have pop-up images of various uh, things such as Outlooks, even MDs. It kind of serves as a kind of an, uh, a, a bit of an overview in terms of uh, product issuances and uh, so forth. And uh, so here's an example of that, where any watches and mesoscale discussions that are, that are um, uh, in effect, those will actually appear in the lower right. And um, so in this case, there's a mesoscale discussion that's in effect. So if you mouse over uh, the mesoscale discussion here, you'll at least see a graphical representation of, of where a mesoscale discussion was issued. So kind of as, as a heads up or awareness uh, uh, type thing in the lower right of the mesoanalysis page. We haven't made many uh, additions in terms of meteorological parameters available, but what we do note here we've, we've added a SARS hail size under composite indices. We don't have time to go into the details of that, but if you click on the left or these uh, question marks when you go into the mesoanalysis website, it'll provide uh, references and corresponding information uh, that relates to the parameters. There's also a snow squall parameter that's added under uh, winter weather as well. We do have forecast information that's available from the from the mesoanalysis website, and uh, that's that's basically provided from the wrap. And um, in general, um, the um, the mesoanalysis is largely influenced by the rapid refresh. The, the rapid refresh provides that three-dimensional information in conjunction with the objectively analyzed surface observations. So there certainly is that influence. So if the rapid refresh is you know, if there's areas of relative struggle, that type of thing, there, there may be some impacts downstream into the mesoanalysis. Okay, a few additional slides here. Uh, another thing that we've added is a HER model browser. This is the SPC take on, on looking at the, the HER model browser. There's, a, again, the direct URL at the top, but also available from the Forecast Tools website. Similar to the mesoanalysis, you have these regional sectors where you can zoom in. In this case, we're looking at the Pacific Northwest, and this is HER model output. And I've got part of it covered up here. But basically, we look at a number of runs, uh, not only the current latest information as it's coming in from the, the HER. This will automatically be up, updated in the upper right. You can also look at prior runs and quickly toggle off using these, these keyboard arrow key um, uh, type uh, uh, functionality to, to look at, uh, kind of get a quick idea of, of the HER, how it may be changing over time. Um, or trending, uh, rather. In this case, we have composite reflectivity turned on, also highways and cities. So we have a number of overlays that we can turn on and off in various uh, parameters, at least a, a quick overview uh, type examination of, of her output. So we wanted to share that that's available. And then we also have, uh, this was updated a couple of, within the last couple of years, these point-specific uh, plumes from the SRF uh, forecast system. And uh, this, you have uh, basically a, a, a large number of uh, point locations across the U.S. that you can look at. In this case, I'm kind of zoomed into Oklahoma. You can see, but by virtue of these these gray circles, how many forecast points there are in in, in the state where we can look at uh, point-specific forecast information from the SRF. 
The trade-off is we don't have a large number of parameters that are available, but we do have things that, that encompass or span temperature, dew point, uh, uh, QPF, CAPE, snow, relative humidity, those types of things. You can also toggle on and off individual uh, members on the right-hand uh, side, the individual members of the SREF. SSEO, we'll quickly run through this. Basically, the SSEO is uh, what we uh, succinctly uh, refer to as the Storm Scale Ensemble of Opportunity. It's basically a group of seven higher resolution deterministic convection allowing uh, models that are all processed into an ensemble. And we think it really provides an efficient means for summarizing data from multiple deterministic convection allowing models. Here's a look at that. Uh, this, uh, output of updraft felicity over a long period, 24-hour period. For Christmas Day, regional severe weather uh, tornado outbreak here in the Gulf Coast region uh, back in 2012. And so that, again, that directory URL is at the top of the website. So with that, uh, I'll, uh, I'll conclude and, and take any questions or comments. And uh, I know we're kind of running up to the top of the hour here. There's my direct email. Uh, if you don't uh, don't have a chance to, to ask your question or you want to follow up with something later, uh, by all means feel free to uh, uh, email me. We do have one additional repeat session this afternoon. And I believe I may have a question here in the uh, software. Let me, uh, let me take a look at that, uh, see if I can pull that up here and, and uh, address that. Um, okay, I see the mention about the winter weather storm report plotting. Thanks for that, that comment uh, on there. I do appreciate that. Uh, let me open up the... Um, I'll pause here on the on the uh, conference call line to see if uh, we have any uh, questions out there. Hey, Jared, this is Bill Samler in Wakefield. I've got a quick question about a slide you showed early on. It was a daily tornado probability for the CONUS. Do you happen to have that map as an annual map? Um, tornado any, probability? Was that the regional one or the? Oh, it was uh, CONUS. CONUS. Uh, I think it was April 24th oh, or something like that. It was yes, yes. Uh, hey, Bill, I uh, appreciate the question on that. That's, uh, that does remind me. I meant to point that out. If you go to the very front of our web page, I believe we do have it for not only tornadoes, but I'm pretty sure uh, hail and wind as well. And so you can look at any – I can't remember. I should know offhand. I, I can't remember if we have it for the individual days or maybe at a week at a time. Um, let me see if I can actually bear with me. I'll try and uh, let's just go to the website. Yeah, I'm there now. It looks like it's daily climatology. Okay. But yeah. It, it would be. I think it would be really interesting to have an annual. Uh, oh, I gotcha. Well. Okay. In terms of. Um, like tornado probability on an annual basis for for a given location. Okay. And the daily data is really cool. Okay. Yeah, but an right. annual map I think would be useful also. Okay. Yeah, that's and we 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 might have uh, something like that in other areas under like the WCM page, but we can always follow up on that and uh, I'll uh, I'll make note of that bill and and uh, I'll uh, brainstorm on it and, and uh, talk to some of the folks here and see uh, um, see see what we could do, potentially do on that and like I say we can all obviously. Uh, uh, follow up as need be on the side. So. Okay, thanks, Jared. Yeah, thanks, Bill. Oops. Okay, other questions uh, that you guys may have out there? Hey, Jared, this is Andy Sullivan. How are you doing? Um, I just had a question on uh, the tornado pro probability. I didn't know it was within 25 miles, which is, you know, interesting just to learn. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any idea how they came over 25 miles? Why didn't they pick 50? You know, because I always thought the percentage is really low, but it makes sense. It's only 25 miles. Do you have any history on that at all? Well, it's it's admittedly history. Some of those details uh, precede me that a lot of that kind of started to shake out in the mid uh, early mid 90 uh, time frame in terms of um, basically. I know what was done was was looking at the database and kind of getting an idea uh, calibration just in terms of how the distributions tend to work as you get into to daily basis of, of uh, looking at these probabilities or the reports. I know Harold Brooks was, was involved in a lot of that. It, you know, fundamentally, it's that notion of if you go, um, well, at an extreme, if you, if you talk about recurrence intervals of tornadoes, 
Uh, heck, here even in, in the middle of Oklahoma uh, in the springtime, if you think about in terms of your individual points, say your house, uh, all things equal, the recurrence intervals may be, even in kind of the prime sorts of areas, still may be talking uh, hundreds of hundreds of years, especially if you're talking about upper end uh, sorts of tornadoes in terms of recurrence intervals. So it's that, that challenge of how to uh, convey uh, uh, very rare information in, into uh, probabilities that, that uh, you know, can be hopefully at least somewhat digestible. So we kind of had to smooth things out a bit, and, and I guess that, that at 25 miles of a point was kind of kind of went to as a, as a balance to, to uh, convey stuff that's, that's at least um, community, uh, immediate area sort of impacting. Certainly, uh, you know, if there's a, uh, even though my house may not be hit, I'm going to at least have a um, very much an interest in, in significant tornado, you know, moving, uh, in this case here, moving through Oklahoma City, what have you, other suburbs. Um, so sure. uh, I, I think that's kind of how, in a, in a very crude sense, how that, that uh, both uh, uh, in terms of feel but also numerically how that, that 25 miles kind of shook out. Okay. Well, thanks, man. I appreciate it. Yeah, thanks, Andy.